Right, well, we're going to have a little look at um, Psalm 23. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard Psalm 23 many times. It's a, a really precious psalm to many of us. So let me just read those words out to you uh, and then I'll, I'll do a, a fairly short message uh, on Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now, here's a big question. So uh, I heard that you guys are from Clapham. I actually went on a camp there uh, years and years ago. Um, uh, it was called Clapham Camps, and we, we stayed on a farm, uh, and they had no toilet. We just had portaloos, no shower. It was it was pretty grim, to be honest, but uh, we had a great time there. But um, there's a lot of sheep around Clapham, so here's my question to you. For, for us to say, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, what must you and I first accept that we are? Sheep. We're sheep, aren't we? Uh, and, and it's kind of true, isn't it? Sheep are kind of quite well known for one thing, aren't they? Uh, if I asked you what a sheep well known for, what might you say perhaps? And you can, anyone interact at any point? Wool. Wool, they're known for wool, yeah. Anything else? Meat. Meat, meat, okay, yeah. What, what about their personality? What's, what's the sheep's personality? Tell you what it is stupid okay uh, sheep are quite known for, for being stupid aren't they and um, and it's true isn't it there's no creature which will lose itself quicker th than a sheep uh, i'm sure when when you've been in clapham when we've been i, I like the lake districts a lot uh, you, you've seen a sheep sort of lost by the wayside or lost in, in a cattle grid and, and they're prone to wander aren't they that they'll they'll wander right from the lush green grass straight into the wolf's den and the truth is this, without a shepherd, the sheep simply would not survive. Um, believe it or not, I've got friends uh, and I've got a friend uh, one, one year, me and my friend Ephraim uh, and another friend called Luke, we decided to go on a camping trip uh, to the Lake District. And what you need to know about Ephraim is he's a big car fanatic and he had this really old fashioned 1980s Volvo. So we decided let's take that car all the way up to the Lake District. So we're driving along and we come down this narrow mountain valley pass. And as Ephraim's driving along, we look up the mountain and here's this sheep, this, this beautiful woolly sheep. It's just bounding down the mountain, just bounding as fast as it could. And then it keeps running, running, running until what do you think happens? bang, we, we hit that sheep. And, um, you know, al almost yeah, unanim unanimously, we, we ran out of the car and we were all quite scared. Uh, and me and Luke, we ran out of the car and said, oh no, no, the poor sheep, the poor sheep. But Ephraim ran out and said, oh no, my poor car, my poor car. You see, he was worried about his car, but on, on a serious note, we were quite worried about the sheep. So what we did is we, we went down the, the road a little bit and we found a hotel and, we gave the, the, the hotel manager, we knocked on the door and we said, could you just uh, let us know, we, we, we've, not, we've, we've hit this sheep and we're a bit worried that it might have brain damage or that it's not going to be okay. Uh, so do you think you could get in touch with the local shepherd? And he said, yeah, yeah, I, I will do. Anyway, before he picked up the phone, he looked at us and he said, what you do need to know is that sheep's probably been hit about eight times already this week. You know, they're well known for that kind of thing. And it's true, isn't it? You know, sheep... They're known for being stupid and often in society we're told whatever you do don't be a sheep don't do it but the christian he must be a sheep so uh, let's get to work i'm going to split this uh this psalm up into three chunks uh, the first chunk is the christian's wants uh, my second heading is the christian's restoration uh, and my third and final heading is is the christian shadow okay so firstly uh, the christian's wants Sweep over to uh, verse one with me, if you've got it in front of you. It says, 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Can I ask you a big question? Are you content with your life? If yeah. everything in your life was taken away from you and you were left with just the Lord Jesus alone, would Jesus, would the Lord Jesus be enough? It's interesting. I want, I want you to go back now to, to when you first got saved and you became a Christian. Do you remember how happy you were? Do you remember what a joy filled your heart? And, and there was almost this stillness as the Lord Jesus led you to those still waters. There was a joy there. And then what happens? Life happened. Things get busy. Perhaps we have children. Uh, we have a job. We, we do all these different things. And that stillness can, can start to, to lose itself. And, and instead, we can start to be restless. You know, the Bible, it talks about in James, like that, that tossing sea. We're, we're no longer that that stillness we we can lose it well my prayer for us tonight is that if we are restless if, if we aren't still that, that the lord would lead us back to those still waters again you know um let me say something a little bit controversial i think sometimes it's quite good uh, for us as sheep to be taken out of that lush green pasture you know, sometimes it's good for, for God to sort of inject a little bit of suffering into our lives, to let a little bit of pain happen in our lives. Why do I say that? Because if a sheep is fed constantly without a pinch of anxiety, do you know what happens? He soon forgets the shepherd. He sort of becomes expectant, entitled. He thinks that he's got everything he needs and he, and he forgets that there is a shepherd who feeds him every single day. And sometimes, if we're honest, when we get everything that we want in life, at times we can doubt whether God even exists. Let me ask you a question now. Here's a question. Do you think, in a moment's time, I'm going to ask you, do you think there are more Christians in Hollywood or more Christians in Ethiopia? So raise your hand if you think there are more Christians in Hollywood. Raise your hand if you think there are more Christians in Ethiopia. You're right. That wasn't a trick question. Don't panic. Uh, yeah, I think there probably are more believers in Ethiopia. I'm not saying everyone in Ethiopia is born again, but is it, it is interesting. You go down Hollywood Boulevard and you see those Hollywood brats there, I say, who, who ha had an iPad since they were three years old. They, they live in mansions. They have everything they need and they don't call upon God. And yet you go into Ethiopia and you give a child a little yogurt pot and their face lights up. They know what it is, is to pray. In Africa, I'm not from Africa, but I've been told they pray for rain. And when it rains, they dance with joy because the Lord God's answered their prayer. So sometimes I think there can be a reason why God might withhold a dream. We might not understand it, but the Bible says that it's this. It says he will supply our every need, not our every lust, not our every craving, but our every need. And sometimes God knows, actually, it's not good for me to have this thing right now. So he withholds it from us. OK, secondly, let's think about uh, the Christian's restoration. Trot over to uh, verse three with me. It says this. It says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you notice how it says he? It's not another, it's only he who can restore your soul. You know, there's one thing I, I believe passionately more than anything, and it's this. Our hearts were designed to worship. Okay, let's go to the Yorkshire Dales. Uh, let's go to the Lake District again. And let's stand on the edge of a mountain. And we look out at all this wonderful scenery, all these massive mountains. Have you done that before? And you feel really, really small. And these mountains feel very vast. They feel so huge. And it feels amazing for some reason. Why is that? Because we were designed for something bigger. We were designed to worship a God who is so big that the universe cannot contain him. And yet, what do we do in life? Uh, we like to make ourselves big. We like to make ourselves the center of the universe and everyone else feels small and little. The truth is this, guys. If we're not actively filling ourselves up with the love of Christ, with the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ, our hearts, which were designed to worship, will automatically run to another poison whether that's a self-help book, whether that's the praise of man, the luxuries of life, we'll run to, to other things. 
The scripture actually says this. It says, it is only he who can restore the years which the locusts have eaten. Now, here's another question for you, okay? You, you'll notice the theme of sheep. There's a lot of sheep in this, in this sermon. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard of a sheep in the whole history of sheep and shepherds? Have you ever heard of a sheep that was murdered when it was stood next to the shepherd's side? Has that ever happened before? It's not, has it? And likewise, there's never been a saint who's been hardened, who's been led away by the devil's schemes when he's been stood next to the shepherd's side. Mm. So deeper fellowship is always the answer. I wonder now if I ask you this question, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand for this, but if I ask you the question, have you ever messed up in life? Since becoming a Christian, have you ever made a mess? I wonder what your answer would be. I wonder if I asked you, are there any skeletons in your closet that really you wouldn't like the rest of your church congregation to know about? I've got to say, in my life, there are many things I wouldn't like people to know about. Perhaps there's someone listening now, whether you're on YouTube or wherever, and you might be struggling with a particular sin. What is the answer? Well, it's interesting. I'm kind of glad that my, my wife's actually putting our baby Samuel to bed so I can tell you lots of secrets about her right now. But here's a, a secret about my wife. Are you ready for it? My wife, Emma, loves chocolate. <laughs> can you believe it? There's a woman on earth who actually loves chocolate, you know, but she does. She's obsessed with chocolate. And in our old house, uh, if you went in our house, wherever you looked, you'd find chocolate. You'd open one drawer and you'd see a big dairy milk bar. You'd go into the cupboard and all these skittles like the advert would, would fall on you. Everywhere you went, there was chocolate. And in front of me, because all this chocolate was there, I'd find myself filling my face with chocolate, even though actually I'm more of a savory kind of guy. I'd find myself eating it. Now, here's what's very interesting. When we filled the house up with lettuce, with pumpkin seeds, with cucumbers, with all those boring things, when we, fed the, when we filled the house with those things and started to eat them, suddenly we didn't have the same appetite anymore for those nasty things. Suddenly we didn't have the same room to, to eat that chocolate. And my dear Christian believer, so it is with you and I. If we fill ourselves up with the good things, with, with prayer, with fasting, with reading the word of God, with church fellowship, with evangelism, if we fill ourselves up with those things, suddenly we won't have the same room anymore for those temptations, for those sins which lead us down places that uh, sometimes we might even be ashamed of. You know, when I was 19 years old and I'd just become a Christian, there was a particular sin which had a real grip on my life. And it, it got me quite depressed and I remember going to the pastor of the church at the time, a guy called David White. And I went up to him and said, David, I, I'm really quite embarrassed about this sin. And I just feel like I keep committing it. I keep going to it time after time. And there's points, if I'm honest, where I think I don't even think I'm a Christian anymore because I keep committing this sin. Uh, and David White looked at me quite wisely and he said, do you remember when you were a child, Joe? Did you ever read those uh, ladybird books when you were a little child? Do you remember those books with a little ladybird on the spine? Do you ever read them? And I said, yeah, yeah, I did. He said, do you know, those books had an interesting motto and it was this. Every day is a new page. Every day is a new page. And he said, Joe, that's how you've got to live your life as a Christian. So today, Lord, I've failed you. Today, Lord, I've made a real mess. But run into the arms of Jesus, the one who died for sinners, the one who the Bible says his blood can wash as white than snow. Run into his arms. He'll forgive you. And remember that tomorrow is a new page. You've forgiven, you're cleansed. And tomorrow there's a new start where you can repent and turn of those sins. I wonder what goes through your mind as I tell you that. As numerous as your wanderings, so numerous your restorations will be. You might have sinned a hundred times, a thousand times, and you might think God might say about you, my spirit will not strive with him anymore. My spirit will not strive with her anymore. But once more, because of the cross, Jesus Christ can say once more, I'll lead you down those paths of righteousness. I'll forgive you. I love you. I saved you. I died for you. Not so that you could earn your way into heaven, but so that you could rest upon my finished work on the cross. Okay, thirdly and finally, 
the Christian shadow. OK, uh, look at verse four with me. It says this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, remember, it's only a shadow for the believer. I won't do this. Uh, and you can't, because we're on Zoom, you can't see any shadows really now. But imagine I'm standing in James's room now. And I pull out a sword, okay? And the shadow falls on James's face. Will the shadow kill James? It won't, will it? Mm -hmm. Okay, suppose I, I, I nip to our other cousin's farm, to the Parkinson's house at Crown Lane, and I, I steal one of the <laughs> shotguns there. I don't know if they have got a shotgun. I don't think they do anymore. <laughs> Rick's moved out, so <laughs> all the guns have gone. But if I pull out a gun, okay, and, and the shadow falls on James, Will the shadow kill James? It won't, will it? And so it is with the believer. If you're putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the sting of death has been removed. It's only the shadow which remains. But that doesn't make it a sort of bed of roses walking down the valley of the shadow of death. You know, death is dark. It's gloomy. The very shadow chills the heart. When a man or woman is caught in darkness, there's no sun just darkness, no hope, just darkness, no peace, just darkness. Anxiety is their friend and sorrow is their companion. And all day long, they carry with them the shivers of this death. And suddenly you might start to warm up, but then these chills return to you. I wonder during this lockdown, if we've walked through that valley of the shadow of death, perhaps loved ones have passed away, or perhaps we've, We've been through uh, what Pilgrim's Progress wrote about, the slough of despondency, where a depression, a darkness it is so deep and it's cast across our life that we feel very low. Some of you have got no idea what I'm talking about, have you? But the rest of you, I'm describing your life. Oh, how we need to pray for those believers who struggle with depression how we need to pray for those Christians who, who, who carry a cross. You see, you might have a, a joyful disposition, but your brother, your sister down the road struggles deeply with anxiety. You know, some of the godliest saints in history walked through that valley of the shadow of death. They, they experienced darkness, depression. Charles Spurgeon. Have you heard of Charles Spurgeon? Nod your head if you, you've heard of him, the Prince of Preachers. Now, what you need to know about Spurgeon is when he'd go to preach, there wouldn't just be four people on a Zoom meeting. There would be literally thousands of people that, that would go and listen to him preach. And word got out about this. And uh, do you know what they did? There were some pranksters. They snuck into the church one night and they called the, as loud as they could at the back of the church, fire, fire. So a bit like Hillsborough, everyone rushed up and ran to the doors and there was a big crush. And that day, uh, seven of Charles Spurgeon's church members died. And for the rest of his life, he, he walked around with this depression, blaming himself, thinking it was my fault they died. David, uh, the writer of this psalm, he also was very depressed. Jerry once wrote this, he said, Lord God, you have collected my tears in a bottle. Now, some of you might be thinking there's not a bottle big enough on earth to, to carry all the tears I've cried in my life. But David knew what it was to be depressed. Job said this, I have one request, O God, that you would crush me. And the prophet Elijah was also suicidal. He said, it is enough now, Lord, take away my life. And that's just the men. Have you heard of uh, Dr. Helen Roosevelt? Have you heard of her? She was a missionary in Africa. And one night she's working away and these Congolese soldiers, they snuck into her room and they terrorized her. They abused her for the rest of her life. She, she had those memories haunting her. Hannah and Rachel, they were barren. They couldn't have children. And Mary Magdalene, let me ask you this. Do you remember Mary Magdalene? She, she walked in and she fell at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she cried so many tears that she was able to wash at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ with her hair and her tears. Can I ask you a question? Do you think those tears were the tears of happiness, of joy? Or do you think they were the tears of joy, uh, of sadness, sorry, knowing that only the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was the one who could help her, uh, was the one who could be close to her? Some of the best saints have abseiled through that valley of the shadow of death, but they still left their mark on the world. Why? Because the man of sorrows, who was acquainted with grief, was their guide. 
suffering Christian, this is just for you. You might uh, be, have just been diagnosed with a terminal illness, but the Bible says you've still got to keep walking. You might be going through a lot of pain right now, but you've still got to keep walking. Your family life might be falling to pieces. Every dream you once had might be falling from you. But the Bible says we've still got to keep walking. Why? Because self-pity doesn't help. None of that will help you. What we need to do is fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, the shepherd who died for sinners, and he'll get you through that dark time. Let me leave you with uh, one final thought. When we get to heaven, if you're a Christian and you've put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we get to heaven, do you think there'll be any shadows in heaven? No. No because the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ will shine so brightly. As that song goes, shine, Jesus, shine. His beautiful glories will shine so brightly that there won't be any room for any shadows. I don't know if anyone listening now has ever been to an after-dinner speech before. Has anyone, have you been to one of them before? No, you don't look particularly cultured as a group, but... Uh, <laughs> well, let me tell you about an after-dinner speech that happened one night where there was a Shakespearean actor. They booked this actor to, to, to recite lots of speeches. And he did, you know, Hamlet's soliloquy, he did another sonnet, did all these different things. And at the end of the night, he said, I've got time for just one more request, just one more request. Does anyone want me to recite something? And there was an 80 year old minister who was in the room at the time. Uh, and he raised his hand and he said, yes, I've got a request. Excuse me, Mr. Actor. Do you know Psalm 23? And the actor said, yes, I do know it. And the Dodrian minister said, would you mind reciting that for us? And the actor said, yes, I will, but under one condition, that after I recite Psalm 23, you, Mr. Minister, you also must recite the psalm. So the minister nodded his head and sat back down. And away went the, the, the actor. He recited it with colour, with diction, with charisma. When he finished, the whole audience stood up. They gave him a standing ovation. There was lots of clapping. Uh, and then he found uh, the actor. He looked him in the eye. The, sorry, the minister. The actor finished. He looked him in the eye and he gave him a wink. And he said, it's your turn now, Mr. Minister. So the minister st stood up. He needed a, a chair to, to hold himself up. And he sort of stammered, he sort of stuttered his way through the psalm. When he finished, the sound of clapping wasn't heard, but the sound of weeping was. And when everything had died down, the Shakespearean actor stood up again and he said this. Now do you see why I asked the minister to go after me? I know the psalm, but he knows the shepherd. I know the psalm but he knows the shepherd. My dear friends, whoever's listening right now, can you say the Lord is my shepherd? Have you got a shepherd who bled and died on a cross and that you know no matter what you go through in this life, you've got a shepherd who'll hold your hand and will guide you through the pains of life and lead you safely to the shores of heaven. I plead with you tonight, if you have not yet received the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, come to him he loves you and he promises that anyone who comes to him he'll by no means cast them out thank you so much for listening i'm really grateful for your time uh, it's been lovely to chat to you all tonight uh, i'll pass back over to james